Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome into an all new episode of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day Podcast. Thanks so much for making Pack a Day part of your daily routine. We always appreciate you a ton. Quick shout out to Bill Patsis for becoming an all new Pack a Day Podcast YouTube member. Appreciate you, Bill. If you have not checked those out yet, make sure to do so. And of course, like, subscribe, comment, five star reviews. Tell your mom, tell your friend and tell everybody about Pack-A-Day. We always appreciate that as well. Today, we're going to be going over the defensive grades from Packers-Browns week one of preseason. I'm going to say the famous last words. Again, I said it on the offensive grades, and I'm not learning my lesson. I think today is going to be a shorter episode. I think there's certainly some players that we want to discuss from that game. Uh, there weren't any like massive plays. I think you know, LVN, Devontae Wyatt, we're going to talk about. We'll talk about certainly some other uh, folks in that game as well who performed well and some who did not perform as well. We'll get to that in just a moment. A couple updates from the end of the day on Tuesday. I did the full training camp review already. If you're thinking, hey, it's it's Wednesday morning. There was training camp on Tuesday. I should be getting the full review. I did not do a quick hits episode yesterday. I did a full review of the training camp uh, practice from Tuesday already. So you can go check that out. But there were a couple things uh, that I did not see in practice that per Bill Cuber uh, took place. So I wanted to go over those very quickly. First of all, I did mention that there was the the buzz that Sean Clifford threw a second interception. I did get confirmation on that. Uh, I got confirmation of that by reading Bill's great article that he puts out every day. And apparently that was by Kalen King. So Kalen King continues to put on a very impressive performance, really from day one of rookie mini camps, OTAs, all of it, like day one of him getting here until now it has just been a stream of consistent play from Kalen King he has been as good as can be expected I mean for a seventh round pick and again I'm not saying he's going to be able to come in and compete for any major playing time or anything like that but I'd be pretty surprised at this point if he's not firmly in that 53 man conversation because you know what you're looking for with young players you certainly would love to see consistency, but I actually think we are seeing some consistency out of Kalen King, but you're looking for upside. You're looking of like, Hey, does this, does this player maybe have a potential to be a starter in the league at some point? And for me that the answer for Kalen is unequivocally. Yes. Again, that may never happen. It may happen sometime this year. We don't know, but does he have the potential to do that? He absolutely does. And if you're showing that you certainly don't want to get rid of a player who is on a rookie seventh round contract deal, which is about as cheap of a contract as there can be in the NFL for four years. You're not giving up on that easily. Uh, you know, so there's, in my opinion, Kalen King is going to be on this roster. He continues to impress day in and day out in another interception in camp on Tuesday. The bad news that I did not know of that I wish I didn't know of is that apparently Jacob Monk dropped out of practice with some sort of injury as well. Uh, no confirmation from anyone that I have seen as to what that injury is or how long that could potentially keep him out. I'm sure we'll hear from Matt LaFleur on Wednesday today uh, as to what hopefully that injury is or how long he could be out. And hopefully he's just back out there on Wednesday. But as of right now, he did drop out of practice and we don't know any sort of update at this time. And uh, by all accounts uh, from Bill and others, it sounds like he did not return to practice at any point. Meanwhile, I mentioned uh, at the end of yesterday's episode that the Packers signed linebacker Chris Russell. I had to do a triple take because I saw that the Packers also signed running back Nate McCrary. Now, if you remember, Nate McCrary was in training camp and I feel like signed right about this time last year. It was towards the end of camp that he got picked up or at least like started to, to play a little bit more. And it's funny because I was doing... You know, as I was looking back at last year's like preseason grades, I looked at Nate McCrary. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I totally forgot about Nate McCrary. And then all of a sudden, a day later, after I'm looking at those, I see a tweet that says the Packers have signed Nate McCrary. And I thought for sure somebody was like doing a retweet of a uh, tweet from last year at this time being like, haha, look at, you know, the Packers signed Nate McCrary, but they actually did. They legitimately signed Nate McCrary. Now that means there needs to be two corresponding roster moves. We have not heard the move for Chris Russell, and we have not heard the move for Nate McCrary. There will be two less Packers at practice tomorrow. I don't like Alex Hale's odds after a, you know, four for, or what, five for nine day at practice. I could be wrong. He could stick around, uh, but, you know, he didn't get any playing time in the game last week, and then he had a rough day at practice on Tuesday. 
that could be one of them, but you know, we'll have to wait and see and, and where Green Bay goes, uh, you know, and what direction they go in as to releasing players and, and freeing up those two spots. But linebacker Chris Russell, running back Nate McCrary, uh, will be with the team. The, the both make sense, right? The linebacker position, Edrian Cooper is out. Tyron Hopper is not doing team right now. There's a good chance he may not do the, you know, joint practices slash pre, you know the preseason game. The same can be said. Uh, so obviously Cooper's out, Hopper's out, and then Quay Walker too is not doing team activities. So he could potentially not play and not do some of the joint practices. I'm not saying he will or won't, but you, know, you have some injuries at that linebacker position. Makes sense that they would bring in Russell. And then for McCrary, remember Jarvion Howard is out right now. Marshawn Lloyd is out right now. That leaves them pretty thin at that running back position. And you know, they're not just going to want to you know play Josh Jacobs a ton either. So getting another running back was really important. And again, that will be Nate McCrary as of right now. All right, let's get to our highest graded players on the odd on the defensive side of the ball. Offensive side, we already did. Go back and check out that episode if you have not done so already. Let's start with our three highest. We'll, we'll go through all of our, our top, I think I have, what, seven here that I want to discuss on the high end. But we'll start with the three players that are tied at top. Evan Williams, Isaiah McDuffie, and Aaron Mosby are the three that I had graded the highest with a plus 0.6 grade for all three of them. Now, Evan Williams, we'll start with him, was involved in the force fumble. I I, I still think he forced it. I've been watching it in slow motion, everything. Like the running back's a little loose with the ball. And then Evan comes in and then like right as Evan's coming in and you know almost to like hit the ball, Anthony Johnson Jr., it like hits him really hard at the same time. So like I'm giving some credit to AJJ for that particular play, but I do think it probably was primarily Evan Williams who forced that out. But either way, a nice job converging on the ball carrier from both Williams and Anthony Johnson Jr. That's what you talk about when you say, you know, you want to get guys to the football and, you know, all of a sudden you sandwich a guy or get, you know, hit him from two different ways. One guy gets his hand in there, the other hits the guy hard, and you're more likely to pop that ball out and get a, uh, a potential fumble recovery there. So that's exactly what happened. But I thought outside of that, the forced fumble by Evan Williams, he was a consistent tackler all throughout the day. I think he ended the day with six tackles, but they were firm, solid, good tackles, took good angles to the football. There was the one play along the sidelines where he barely got his knee down and then the runner popped back up and ran to the end zone. Now it happened that his knee was down and he stepped out of bounds and he did not get in the end zone. I would have liked to have maybe that's the one where it wasn't quite as firm and there was maybe some level of escapability there, but everything else was a super clean tackle easily got his, you know, the, the offensive player to the ground. I thought it was a fantastic performance from Evan Williams. Uh, he came off the bench. It was Xavier McKinney and Javon Bullard starting. And then Williams was kind of the next guy up after that played a decent amount of snaps. And I thought he looked the part just like we've seen all throughout training camp so far. Isaiah McDuffie's the next one. If you're looking for a specific big time Isaiah McDuffie play that you're going to go and watch highlights of, there's not that. There's no forced fumble. There's no interception. There's no sack. There's no incredible blitz or pressure. It was just a super consistent sound game. There is one play where he takes on a block. He pops the guy, sheds it and goes and makes the play. And that has been something that has been so desperately missing from this team. Now, when I talked to Mike Wall last year about Frankie Luvu, and when we talked about him for a while, Luvu will come up and pop you in the mouth, shed that block, and then go make the play. And Green Bay, their linebackers, for better or worse, have been sometimes a little bit more finesse. Quay Walker's in that category. Edron Cooper's probably going to be a little bit in that category, although he does have some physicality as well. But you don't have those big thumpers. And there's a reason sometimes that they're for that, because a lot of times those guys aren't quite as good in coverage. So like you have to sort of figure that out. Sometimes you don't want to be platooning because it's not like, you know, if it's going to be a run or a pass in any given moment. So long story short, you saw, uh, again, the physicality that McDuffie played with, get, you know, taking on a block, shedding the block, going and making a play. I thought he was consistently in the right spot at the right time. He tackled well and was just kind of all over the place. And I think these are sort of the interesting cautionary tales of preseason sometimes. Let, let's think through this logically, right? Now let's take Jeff Halfley and this new defensive system and let's just place it to the side for a moment. Pretend that that's not a thing. What are the odds that after seeing three years of Isaiah McDuffie, that in year four, all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, look how amazing Isaiah McDuffie is. 
far more often than not, and I mean far more often than not, the player that you're going to see is for the most part the player that you've seen in previous seasons. There will be some growth, but it's not like you all of a sudden see these linebackers or whatever player it is, and all of a sudden year four and just be like, boom, oh my goodness, look how how much better they are. Unless they maybe haven't played at all. And again, it, we can talk about Jordan Love and etc. But for a player like that who has played, to all of a sudden just get so much better is probably not super realistic. We probably have a pretty strong feel for who Isaiah McDuffie is as a player. But I will say this. He has been really, really good in training camp. Like making plays every day it is run defense in particular. I think there could still be some issues at times with his uh, coverage ability. But in run defense, he's been everywhere. And he followed that up in preseason, showing what he's been showing in practice, taking it into a game and doing the same thing. And that's where I will bring back that Jeff Halfley aspect and say, I think it is worth noting that Jeff Halfley, maybe not so much at the linebacker spot, but there definitely will be a little bit of that as well. There will be players playing a entirely new system and being asked to do totally different things than what they were asked to do in Joe Barry's de- uh, defense. And for hopefully almost everyone, that will be a good thing for some players that might be a bad thing, but you could theoretically see some players who we have experience watching, but maybe this system is the system that works better for them. And maybe we do see some players take off. And Isaiah McDuffie, of course, is one of the players that actually has some familiarity with Jeff Halfley's defense. So far, it has looked very good, a plus 0.6 grade, and really liked what I saw out of Isaiah McDuffie in this game. Aaron Mosby is another one where, again, there's not any big time sack. He uh, closed the back door is what I like to call it. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, sort of a semi-common jargon term. So it's a stretch play usually to the right. And there's that cutback lane. And it's the backside defender who's unblocked. And it's their job to scrape down the line and close any cutback lane off. He did a nice job of that on one particular play. Had a couple nice pass rush snaps. He uh, batted down the ball on a fourth down, which was a key play in the game. So just some really good stuff for Mosby. And he has been a player I tweeted out last week where he has had a very quietly nice camp. And I know that's kind of a cliche thing, but almost every day he's making a play. And, you know, from a a backup rotational edge rusher, there was some question as to whether or not he was going to be an inside linebacker and edge rusher. He's done both throughout his career. He has a lot of special teams experience. He's not, I would say, in a great spot to make a 53. I don't think it's impossible. He played better than Bretton Cox. We'll talk about Bretton Cox in just a moment. But he played, I thought, significantly better than Bretton Cox in this game. I don't know if they keep a fifth defensive end. And if they do it, I still kind of lean that Brenton Cox maybe has the better upside here, but most we can play special teams. I don't think it's likely. I don't think it's, you know, I would be pretty surprised if he ends up making the initial 53, but Mosby's definitely a guy that I would keep an eye on for one of those practice squad spots and somebody that if you need to call up, I think he has some value on this team. And uh, I would be very happy if we see Aaron Mosby on the practice squad with the, I think, skill set that he has to maybe be called up and actually help you a little bit on game day, primarily on special teams. LVN plus 0.45 was fourth on my list. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be like, holy cow, I thought LVN was going to be the highest graded defender. He had the sack, he had some pressures, three, you know, what, two quarterback hits, three tackles for loss. Yes, he was involved in a lot of different plays. And I thought he had a really nice game overall. All the things that we just mentioned, the, the box score is fantastic. He made an impact on the field. One of the sacks was due to an immediate pressure. The, the sack that he had was due to the immediate pressure from Devontae Wyatt. It's a little bit better of a play from Wyatt and LVN cleaned it up. I thought there were other plays throughout the course of the game where he was able to get into the backfield and make his presence felt. There were, however, other plays where he struggled to get off blocks. And I thought, you know, Ben Fennel, you know, kind of talked about it uh, and he tweeted it out. I'm going to see if I can pull this up really quick from Ben because he talked about uh, LVN and kind of what he saw from um, from a, uh, L- you know, he went back and watched all of the tape for Lucas Van Ness. And here's here's what he had to say. Sorry, I didn't have that ready ahead of time. He said, second year edge, Lucas Van Ness still has a long ways to go as a nuanced pass rusher. Looks lost, underdeveloped with his pass rush plan, hand timing, counters, and working the half man. But plays hard, 
Bull in a China shop, effort and chase, can use him on stunts game, certainly should bully tight ends in the run game. And I just going back to that first part, it's a lot of what I saw on tape. And it's not, it's why he doesn't have this massive grade in this game. There were, he got a lot of playing time in this game. And you saw a few plays where he made an impact. There were a lot of plays and some plays going up against some second stringers where he did not make that impact. And I think there's still a lot of growth. And there's a reason why they are playing LVN more right now in this defense. And because he didn't have a lot of snaps in college, Matt LaFleur mentioned that this week. And I think it's going to be something that they try to get him as many reps as they can to keep that growth plan moving because you learn by playing in the games and you learn by getting reps and he does need to put a better pass rush plan together. It looks like he is still sort of, you know, has a couple pieces here and there, but you're, you're like not even making out the border of what your puzzle is going to be yet. So there's still a ways to go. Still chock full of potential. Looks the part, size, speed, athleticism, all of it, but needs a little bit better plan. We and like, here's the crazy thing, right? He doesn't have that yet. And he still made a pretty significant impact in this game. And we're talking about him as the fourth highest graded player on defense in this one. So there's still a lot to like about LVN, but still some uh, growth to go for him in his journey to becoming a top tier pass rusher in this league. Devontae Wyatt, similar. He was next plus 0.3. And I think here there's a different dichotomy of Devontae Wyatt than in how it's different than what LVN is. Wyatt looked phenomenal as a pass rusher. He looked great. He made three disruptive plays. One led to the sack by LVN. He was easily winning up front and getting into the backfield and being an agent of chaos. In run defense, it didn't look as good. And I thought he really struggled at times just to anchor and hold up at the point of attack or and make sure that he is not allowing him to get moved off the ball to create some of those rushing lanes and alleys for the opposing team. Devontae might just be a rotational player. Put him more in on obvious passing downs and just let him cook. And that's not the worst thing in the world. If he can play like that, because he didn't have many opportunities in, as a pass rusher, and he made the most of almost every single one of them. If you maybe utilize him less on early downs and you make him a primary pass rusher on the interior, and that's his goal, and you just say, hey, this is who you're going to be, I might just weaponize that because I think he's that good as a pass rusher that he can be, that like just weaponize that and figure out the run defense elsewhere. You know, maybe let Kenny, TJ Slayton, those guys play a little bit more on early downs and then let Devontae really cook come obvious pass downs. And I think that's okay. I still hope that Devontae can continue to get better against the run. But in this game, had a couple plays here and there that I think from a run defense standpoint, you would like to have back. All right, last two, two safeties, Javon Bullard, plus 0.25, and Anthony Johnson Jr., plus 0.25 as well. I thought both of them were all over the place. I thought Bullard, especially, his closing speed is just ridiculous. And how he gets to the football, takes good angles, had a really big hit on one play. I mean, talk about just looking the part of a safety, and he's going to fit so well next to Xavier McKinney. I think there's as, as good as Evan Williams has been, and I think you can make an argument Williams has been better at times, I still love what uh, what Javon Bullard is bringing to the table. Uh, they have two potential starters there in both of those guys. And, you know, just Bullard flowing to the football, like it, it looks so natural and so easy for Bullard. And that's what gets me the most excited. Meanwhile, Anthony Johnson Jr. had my favorite play of the day and of the entire game when he came up like a, you know, shot out of a cannon and attacked the tackle. Like he just went right into the offensive tackle. It was a, it was a, I think, a, I don't know if it was a stretch play or a, I think it was like a sweep to the left. And Anthony Johnson Jr. just wrecks the tackle. And he, he can't say he wrecked him because it's not like he got him off his feet, but he jars him backwards. The running back realizes he can't come around because there's somebody that's forcing that edge, which was Anthony Johnson Jr. just going full wrecking ball into an offensive tackle. He tries to cut it back. It goes for, I think it went for a loss on the play, but just a beautiful play from Anthony Johnson Jr. He had a couple other nice plays as well, but he did have one play where he missed on a tackle. He knew it right afterwards. He was upset with himself. He'll clean that up, but AJJ has looked really good in camp so far. Also was involved in that forced fumble play, same as Evan Williams. So really nice days from the safeties. Evan Williams, Javon Bullard, and Anthony Johnson Jr. all made the list. 
All right, my three lowest graded Packers for the day. My lowest was Gemin Green. Actually, I have four lowest graded Packers. Gemin Green at negative 0.55. Gave up multiple completions. Would have given up the touchdown, but there was a penalty on the play, and they ended up, uh, I think, running it in later. But either way, um, just not super tight coverage on, I would I want to say, probably three or four different plays. So that needs to get crisped up just a little bit. Uh, next was James Esther, negative 0.45. Just struggled to hold up uh, at the point of attack in the run game and couldn't get off of blocks to get to the quarterback. He played a lot in the fourth quarter and just couldn't make really any sort of real impact. Brenton Cox, negative 0.4. I was really hoping for more from Brenton Cox. It was not shown in this game. Uh, he got sucked inside on one play, or at least he he, he lost contain on one play. Uh, couldn't get off of blocks. Didn't make much of effort. Or not, I shouldn't say effort. He didn't make much of an impact as a run defender. Just again, you were left wanting a little bit more from Brenton Cox. And I thought coming in, you know, him getting that playing time, he looked so great in OTs and mini camps. He just hasn't been able to, you know, follow that up in training camp and in preseason so far. He's got two games left to try to go and earn a roster spot. This was a little bit of a hang with him for uh for Brenton Cox. And then Kingsley and Nigbari, he had a negative 0.25. It wasn't anything brutal, but I just thought he struggled to get off of blocks, but I'm willing to give him more of a pass. He's, you know, just the fact that he's out there that you you thought maybe what tore his uh, ACL ended up not being an ACL. He's just, I think, getting back in the swing of things. I have no concerns about Enigbari, but just struggled to get off blocks a little bit in this one. So again, my highest graded players, Evan Williams plus 0.6, Isaiah McDuffie plus 0.6, Aaron Mosby, plus 0.6, LVN, 0.45, Devontae Wyatt, 0.3, Bullard, 0.25, Anthony Johnson Jr., 0.25. My lowest, Gemin Green, negative 0.55, James Esther, negative 0.45, Brenton Cox, negative 0.4, Kingsley and Igbari, negative 0.25. In case you're wondering, PFF's highest graded players in this one, Robert Rochelle was number one, Evan Williams was two, Christian Young was three, Colby Wooden was four, and Zane Anderson was five. So only Evan Williams made our... Uh, our, you know, both of our lists in the top five. And then bottom five for PFF was LJ Davis, Spencer Waggy, Brenton Cox, Kingsley and Igbari, and Kenneth Odomegwu. So Brenton Cox and Kingsley and Igbari both were on uh, both of our lists. Uh, some interesting snap count numbers for two of the defenders. Kenneth Odomegwu only played six snaps and was behind even the two new guys that they just picked up a week ago. So any idea that Kenneth Odomegu is in any real competition for a 53, it's just not like he, again, played six snaps in this game, less than the two guys they just picked off up off the street a few days prior to that. And Benny Sapp, the third, only seven snaps in this one. Now, that's a tough spot to get into with all those young safeties and wanting to get a ton of playing time for those guys. But Kitano Adapo hasn't even been playing yet. It, it's a, it's been tough. He only got seven snaps. He did make one good play on it. Didn't have a bad grade or anything, but those were two interesting ones from a snap standpoint that they just did not get a whole ton of playing time. All right, friends, that's going to do it for me today. I should be back later today with a quick hits episode of everything that happened at training camp on Wednesday. I will see you guys then. Shout out to our Hall of Fame and All-Pro members, Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Brad Dad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donnelly, Lori Lord, Baby QB, Dave McCluskey, Donald Decker, Dan Miller, Alex Huang, Arnaldo Espinosa, Peter Rataka, Caleb Cookster, SoCal Pack, Dan Gesford, and Love and Football. I'll see you today, later. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.